Welcome back to the theater of the absurd and the programming of the individual for the profit of the moneyed interest. People are living in the matrix, but the thing is, people living in the matrix don't know that they're living in the matrix. So it has been left up to me to expose each and every scam perpetrated on the population. I will be your personal red pill. It's just a scam. Hello and welcome to a new episode of It's a Scam. It's been a while since my first offering on this channel as I was running for office and I was trying to complete my autobiography before the general election. And although I completed my autobiography in time for the general, I lost in the primary. So my story didn't get the attention that it deserved. Still, I posted it on YouTube with the title, The Jeff Brown Story, Tales of Woe. So if you're interested, check it out. Since then, I've just been procrastinating. I thought coming back to this channel, I would try and take it easy and pick some low hanging fruit. Something so obviously a scam that I can't believe that it's still a thing. So the topic for today is seatbelt laws. Let's start with the whole idea of seatbelt laws. The state government is going to force you to wear a seatbelt under penalty of law and use armed gunmen to enforce this law and steal your money. Clearly, this is just highway robbery. Something you will hear me say more than a few times on this channel going forward is the concept of taxation through citation. If the government wants to fund a program, even a very worthy program like emergency medical services and ambulances, Politicians are still afraid to suggest we raise taxes to pay for that. Instead, they try and find a segment of the population that they can demonize and bully and target and then pass laws to make that segment of the population taxable by citation. For example, anybody who drinks alcohol or does drugs. But in every case, they usually try and make some kind of argument as to why we must steal money from this segment of the population. So what possible justification can they make to steal money from the segment of the population known as comfortable drivers? It seems that they're trying to paint this as some sort of public safety issue. No, really they are, but how are they doing this? First, let's look at what the function of a seatbelt is and try to figure out how this can possibly be a threat to public safety that requires such extreme intervention. The seat belt is a medical device, pure and simple. It has no function in the operation of the vehicle. It's purely a prophylactic medical device that may have some theoretical benefit in the unlikely event of a crash. And the only potential benefit is during a crash. They have no other function. Whether or not you wear a seatbelt has zero effect on the public at large or other drivers or passengers. So how can this possibly be a public safety issue? Historically, we have built a body of law regarding the individual's right to control their own body. And we allow people to do dangerous things as long as they don't hurt anyone else. Alcohol and tobacco come to mind as well as riding motorcycles. Motorcycles are inherently more dangerous than cars, but we still allow people to ride them. We still allow people to eat sugar, despite the mounting body of evidence of the connections to diabetes, heart disease, and cancer. And these are the leading causes of death in this country. And yet you're supposed to have a right to your own bodily integrity and make your own choices based on your own assessment of risk versus reward. And I'm talking about adults here. Adults have the constitutional right to privacy. I should really say a, a common law right to privacy because common law is law that is derived from the courts and accepted over time. An example of common law in the United States since the founding uh, would be Roe versus Wade or Griswold v. Connecticut. Although there's no law from a legislature 
defining a right to privacy? The Supreme Court has ruled that because of what they have called a penumbra of rights guaranteed, that a right to privacy can be inferred. And what they mean by a penumbra is a group of rights that are derived by implication from other rights that are explicitly protected in the Bill of Rights. And as the Ninth Amendment says, the enumeration in the Constitution of certain rights shall not be construed to deny or disparage other rights retained by the people. The right to privacy by court rulings has been interpreted in the past to include the right to refuse medical treatments. And then in 1991, the right to refuse end-of-life care was guaranteed to Americans with the passage of the Federal Patient Self-Determination Act. You now have the right under federal law to have your respirator removed even if you know the result will be certain death. You have the right not to have a forced medical procedure or be forced to donate organs. Any unwanted medical procedure is considered an unwanted touch or even battery. There are exceptions for children and people with an altered mental state or people who are considered a threat to the community. But the point is, a seatbelt is a medical device and wearing one is a medical decision, just like using a cane or wearing a jock strap. So how do we get to this point where it is considered normal to force people to wear a seatbelt at the point of a gun? There have been challenges to this, including at least one case that I found that made it to the Supreme Court. That case was called Atwater v. Lago Vista. I looked it up to see what kind of reasoning was used to justify this intrusion. One of the reasons this case made it to the Supreme Court was because it involved an actual arrest. As the story goes, the plaintiff named Atwater had been stopped by a police officer for not wearing a seatbelt. He gave her a verbal warning. Then about three weeks later, the same officer sees Miss Atwater again and she's not wearing her seatbelt, and neither are her three children. The law also states that small children riding in front must be secured. So the cop decides to arrest Miss Atwater. He removes her from the car, handcuffs her, and her kids become hysterical. One of the children runs to a friend's house and gets her friend's mother who takes the kids while the cop makes the arrest. She's transported downtown, searched. She had to take her shoes off and her jewelry. She had to empty her belongings. She's locked in a jail cell for about an hour until someone shows up with $310 to bail her out. When she gets out, she finds her car has been impounded. And then she finally has to pay 50 bucks for the no seatbelt ticket. After that, she files a lawsuit against the city alleging that the city had violated her Fourth Amendment right to be free from unreasonable seizure. The district court dismisses the case given her admission that she had violated the law and the absence of any allegation that she was harmed or detained in any way inconsistent with the law. Atwater's argument was that founding era common law rules forbade officers to make warrantless misdemeanor arrests, except for in cases of breach of the peace. That's a category she claims was then understood narrowly as covering only those non-felony offenses involving or tending towards violence, like someone getting in a fist fight. However, there was considerable precedent to the opposite argument that the police don't need a warrant to make an arrest if someone is openly violating the law in front of a police officer, like violating a curfew or having an illegal poker game. And now, of course, that would include not wearing a seatbelt. But what did the court say about the whole idea of seatbelt laws in the first place? They determined that since it was only a misdemeanor with no jail time and only a maximum fine of $50, that it was perfectly reasonable. There is no constitutional protection 
to prevent the government from stealing small amounts of money from you. The court did admit that decisions on the Fourth Amendment generally require a balancing of individual and government interests. However, from my reading of the opinion, I saw very little of that. So I thought I might try it. Let's see if I can figure out what the government interests are in forcing adults to wear seatbelts and then balance that against the citizen's right to individual liberty and bodily autonomy. I see the issue as very similar to the arguments over motorcycle helmet laws. And one of those cases made it to a Massachusetts district court called Simon v. Sargent in 1972. The court tried to define the government's interest. Here was their argument. From the moment of the injury, society picks the person up off the highway, delivers him to a municipal hospital and municipal doctors, provides him with unemployment compensation, and after the recovery, if he cannot replace his lost job and injury causes permanent disability, the government may assume the responsibility for his and his family's continued subsistence. We do not understand the state of mind that permits plaintiff to think that only he himself is concerned. So the basic argument is uh, the health care costs, the continued productivity of the citizen, and of course if they were serious about that argument, they wouldn't allow people to ride a motorcycle in the first place, whether they're wearing a helmet or not. Motorcycles are far more dangerous than cars, whether you wear a seatbelt or not. Some states have argued there is a danger of multi-car collisions that could be caused by a biker who loses control after being struck in the head by an airborne object. Although they have very little statistical evidence to back that up. Ohio is one of 25 states that doesn't have a mandatory helmet law. We used to until 1969. And then we had the case called State v. Betts. Now in this case, which was decided right here at the Franklin County Municipal Court, <clears throat> the judge renders a rather poetic opinion. We see little danger to the traveling public from motorcyclists being struck on the bare head by an object. The public risk from such a source is at best remote. Any legislative inhibition of individual liberty must be supported by facts demonstrating a compelling public need. Mere speculation, supposition, or incidental public benefits are not sufficient. We are not aware of any substantial history of highway injuries or collisions resulting from bareheaded motorcycling. The Craig decision cites no such experience. As pointed out in American Motorcycle Association v. Davids, the court is not required and should not stretch its imagination to find a relationship to the public health, safety, and welfare. Such relationship must be readily apparent to support a police regulation. If, in fact, the General Assembly apprehended danger from objects striking bare heads, would it have not have specified similar protective devices for all categories of bareheaded users of the public roads? An open automobile, out of control as a result of a driver being struck on his bare head by an object is far more lethal instrument than a motorcycle. Yet there has been no attempt to require the drivers of convertibles to don helmet and goggles. Would not the same reasoning apply to the operators of all open vehicles such as bicycles, tractors, and other farm machinery and highway maintenance equipment? The statute in question refers to both bicycles and motorcycles in the first two paragraphs, but pointedly limits the helmet and goggles requirement to motorcyclists. We must conclude that Section 4511.53 Revised Code is designed only for the protection of the individual motorcyclist. Whether or not a motorcyclist wears a helmet and goggles is a matter of concern solely to the individual involved. Included in man's liberty is the freedom to be as foolish, 
foolhardy or reckless as he may wish, so long as others are not endangered thereby. The state of Ohio has no legitimate concern with whether or not an individual cracks his skull while motorcycling. That is his personal risk. There is too much nonsensical regulation of purely personal affairs in today's government. Liberty is almost unknown. You are permitted to take it in homeopathic doses when administered by some commission or court. But what that measure of liberty may be, you cannot tell until this court decides. It is high time that we're going back to the Constitution instead of going back on the Constitution. Wow, how wonderful it is, and so rare, to hear the voice of common sense coming out of a courtroom in this country. And when it does, it sounds like music to the ears. Thank you, Judge Rowley. And then after that decision, poof, we had no more helmet laws. But I have digressed to talk about motorcycles. Let's get back to seat belts and determine the government's interest in forcing you to wear them. And here it is. You knew this was coming. My favorite reference publication, Ohio Traffic Crash Facts. Let's do a quick summary of the data in Ohio. Ohio has 11.5 million people. There were 1,179 traffic fatalities in 2017, which means about a thousandth of a percent of Ohio citizens died in a traffic accident. Ohio has less than one fatality for every 100 million vehicle miles traveled. Ohio has 8.2 million licensed drivers. And in 2017, there were 507,891 total drivers involved in crashes. This means almost 94% of drivers were not involved in any crash. And remember, seatbelts have no function whatsoever if you don't crash your car. So in 2017, 94% of the drivers had zero use for their seatbelt. Of the 303,000 crashes, 74% were property damage only. About 25% were injury accidents, and only 0.36% were fatal injury accidents. Now let's see what effects seatbelts have on these statistics. In Chapter 3, Table 3.04 on the use of restraints, one of the columns they use is one called not available, meaning they didn't have sufficient information to include in the seatbelt data. So I don't want to use those numbers, and I'm going to make my own table without those numbers included. So be aware as we move on that the numbers may not add up, and that's the reason why. The reason I want to make my own table is to show data for the last 10 years and not base my reasoning just on one year. But for starters, I'll use the most recent year in 2017. In 2017, the number for total fatalities was 840. And the number of people who died wearing their seatbelt was 369. The number of those not wearing their seatbelt was 385 or very close to a 50-50 toss-up. A difference of 16 people out of 11.5 million should not be used as justification to steal millions of dollars from the public. Just the logic itself that stealing money can fix a public safety issue is mind-boggling. The overall fatality rate in Ohio is just extremely low, however you look at it. This column shows you the percentage of people who were doing what they were told and were wearing their seatbelt. The first thing to emphasize is that people wearing their seatbelts still die. Seatbelts are not a guarantee that you won't die. As mentioned, in 2017, it was almost a 50-50 split. But that was just one year, which is why I want to go back 10 years and do some averaging. And also look at the issue of compliance. When you look at the fatalities for 2017, and 2016, you can see that the compliance rate was over 40% and the death rate between belted and unbelted was pretty similar. This is because the more people you have wearing seatbelts, you have more people who will be dying while wearing them. That only makes sense. And if you compare that to 2008 and 2009, you can see that the compliance rate is lower 
and the disparity between the two groups is higher. So I did an average of the data for these 10 years and found that regarding traffic fatalities, over 60% of the people were not wearing their seatbelt. The numbers were 305 deaths were wearing their belt and 389 were not. The difference as a percentage between the two groups was about 27%. Considering that 60% were not using their belts, but only 27% more people were dying, seatbelts are not as effective as you might think. But yes, we can conclusively say that seatbelts do save lives, and the 10-year average is that 84 more people died not wearing their seatbelts. That's out of 11.5 million people, 8.2 million drivers, and all the statistics that I gave you earlier. The question is, when do we get to make our own decisions and make our own risk assessment about what we do with our own lives and our own bodies? We already talked about the fact that in Ohio you can ride a motorcycle without a helmet, without being treated like a criminal. And, as luck would have it, there's a mystery column on my chart. This is the number of people on motorcycles who died who weren't wearing a helmet. As you can see, it's more than the number of unbelted motorists. And although the numbers seem pretty comparable, you have to understand that the number of motorcycles registered in Ohio is about 410,000. And the number of cars, trucks, buses, and other motor vehicles is over 10 million. So bikers die at a much higher rate, but yet they're still treated like adults and not subject to punishment. Why is this? Well, run, one reason might be that riders are organized and they have their own lobbying organizations like the American Motorcycle Association and ABATE. And these organizations represent their members and they resist legislation. But if you're a conspiracy-minded person like I am, and believe this whole seatbelt thing is just a scam to make money, then it would only make sense to focus on the 10 million vehicles and the 8.2 million drivers rather than the much smaller numbers you would make for motorcycles. Again, fatalities only represent about 0.36% of all crashes. So focusing on them ignores the much larger issue, which are injury accidents. So let's take a look at injuries. For those of you playing at home, I am still using table 3.04 of Ohio traffic crash facts. Okay, the total number of injuries used by this table for 2017 is 100,020. The number of people injured who were not wearing their seatbelt was 7,109. And the number of people injured who were wearing their seatbelt wait for it, was 88,111. That's right, more than 12 times the number of people injured were wearing their seatbelts. Okay, there's a logical reason for this. The chart also shows that 88% of the people were wearing their seatbelts. So you have a very high compliance rate. However, 88% compliance means you have a 12% non-compliance. So you have seven times the number of people wearing their seatbelts but they have more than 12 times the number of injuries. And let's look at the 10-year average. People not using their seatbelt, the average number was 7,452. And those wearing their seatbelt, 85,386, with an 87% compliance rate. That's over 11 times greater. So people wearing seatbelts not only suffer vastly more injuries, but they're also getting injured at a higher rate, with no benefits from seatbelts being apparent. And remember, the difference in fatalities between the two groups was less than 100. In America, it's supposed to be my body, my choice. You can have your respirator removed, even if it means certain death, but you can't have your seatbelt removed, even though death is only a remote possibility. Based on these numbers, there is no compelling government interest in forcing you to wear a seatbelt. So that leaves only one thing left. The only interest the government has in enforcing these laws is that it gives them an excuse to steal your money. Period. We have become a banana republic with government goons robbing you by the side of the road in broad daylight. 
And the way they get people to keep accepting this is through the use of fear. Through the use of fear in bullshit. That's how they keep you submissive. Here's, here's an example. I was watching Channel 6 around the last Thanksgiving, and they ran a story that was trying to scare people into using seatbelts by using traffic data from the previous Thanksgiving. The Ohio Department of Transportation issued a press release claiming that last year, 16 people died during the holiday weekend, and seven of them were not wearing their seatbelts. Channel 6 just took this press release and runs it as part of their story without comment. Does anybody see problems with these numbers? First of all, 16 deaths out of 11.5 million people over a five-day travel period? That's an incredibly low number. That should be the headline. But then they say 7 out of 16 were not wearing their seatbelts. Well, that means 9 out of 16 were. More people died who were wearing their seatbelt. And yet they just air this stuff without challenge. Oh, and by the way, after Thanksgiving, it was reported that despite a record number of travelers on the road that year, we also set a record for lowest fatalities with six. Now here's an article that's a little more transparent about their motives. This is from the Willoughby News Herald in June 2017. This is another government propaganda article promoting the use of seatbelts, or rather justifying why they need to take your money. There are quotes from Ohio Patrol Sergeant Daniel Kumor, and he leads with quoting numbers from the NHTSA that claims nationally in 2015 there were 9,874 people killed who were unbuckled. All right, well, what I wonder is how many people died who were wearing their seatbelts. He doesn't tell you that. But, thanks to modern technology, I looked it up myself. And here's their chart. Sergeant Kumar wasn't lying. There's that 9,874 number of un unbuckled victims he was talking about. But right next to it is the number of buckled victims, and that number is 10,635. That's right, more people died wearing their seatbelts by a margin of 47 to 44%. Then the article goes on to describe a competition held between states to see who can write the most seatbelt tickets. It's called the Six State Trooper Project, Safety Belt Enforcement. And that ran for seven days from May 22nd to May 29th. And Ohio came in first with 9,533 and the other five states had fewer than 2,000. This article also mentions that just up until June 2017, Ohio already had over 73,000 seatbelt enforcements. And then Sergeant Kumar becomes nakedly honest about law enforcement attitudes about writing these tickets. For a simple license plate, I am more inclined to give a warning for the ticket and just issue the seatbelt citation. He said, we are pretty much all the time always looking for seatbelt violations. Of course, the police always try and take credit for low traffic numbers, trying to convince people that it was because of them that the numbers are low. Because otherwise, if they weren't around, you would always be looking for the next opportunity to crash your car into a bridge. And they like to have it both ways. If the numbers are low, they claim tough enforcement is necessary because, look, it's working. If the number is high, they claim they need more enforcement because it's not working. All they're doing is justifying their own positions. As mentioned in the article, through June 2017, 73,000 tickets were given. In Ohio, the fine is $30. So that's about $2 million for six months or about $4 million a year. You know how, from what I can tell from reading the code, is that all the money raised from seatbelt fines is forwarded to the treasurer of state and is to be used for trauma and emergency medical fund. Now, don't get me wrong, I think we need to fund emergency medical. I personally have only ever been ticketed for seatbelts once in my life, 
and I've been driving for 44 years. I would be happy to throw 30 bucks into the kitty for emergency medical every 40 or 50 years. If they would just ask me, there's no need to steal it. And I'm not trying to make seatbelts illegal. I'm not even trying to convince you not to wear them. Please do so if it makes you feel comfortable. The question that I'm trying to raise is, at what point do we have a national emergency so grave that it is appropriate to send armed gunmen into the streets and take people's money? And my answer is, this ain't it. I think it's worth repeating the words of Judge Riley in the Betts Helmet case. Any legislative inhibition of individual liberty must be supported by facts demonstrating a compelling public need. Mere speculation, supposition, or incidental public benefits are insufficient. So where are the facts demonstrating a compelling public need? Well, there aren't any. There are no facts supporting any benefit from wearing seatbelts or any increased danger from not wearing them. And it shouldn't be any business of the government, even if there were. The numbers are being cherry-picked and manipulated and then presented precisely to create a narrative to justify this con job. The only numbers you can show is the amount of revenue streaming into the state of Ohio. That is what they consider to be a compelling public need. Regardless of what the funds will be used for, this is clearly nothing more than theft, and it's stealing. And stealing is wrong. And it's a scam. It's a scam.